Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. This is Carly Stevens Books for all things writing, publishing, and indie author life. And I have the distinct privilege today to speak to Susie Q. Smith, um, who is an award-winning artist, organizer, and educator who lives in Denver, Colorado. She has created, curated, coached, and taught in Denver for over 20 years, managing the largest poetry festivals that Denver has seen to date. Um, the TEDx, uh, a TEDx speaker multiple times, Susie has performed throughout the United States for over a decade and has shared stages with Nikki Giovanni, the late Gil, Scott Heron, and many more. The author of poetry collections, Poems for the End of the World, A Gospel of Bones, and 13 Descansos, Susie is also a singer-songwriter, playwright, and multidisciplinary creative. Currently, she is affiliate faculty with Regis University's Mile High MFA, Lighthouse Writers Workshop, and DU's Prison Arts Initiative, as well as the Margins Conference Director for The Word. She also serves as a community representative on the Denver County Cultural Council. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. <laughs> thank you, Carly. And yes, I know that's a lot to say. <laughs> thank you. It for is, but, but it's <laughs> worth saying. That is an impressive number of accomplishments. And I, I, I had to pick and choose in some places there's even more uh that I I could have said but but uh wow I'm I'm so excited to get into our topic today which is poetry that that you are so brilliantly proficient in so would you just give us a little bit of background on yourself beyond what I said of course but how did you first get into writing at all so I've been writing I think probably since I could hold a pen um so I was, I was, might've been writing before I was speaking. <laughs> so it's been, um, you know, as far back as I can remember, I think um, there are a lot of different influences. I'm the youngest in my family. And so my older siblings speaking all the time helped me pick up on language, I think pretty quickly. So I've probably been writing little poems since I was, you know, three or four. And then poems just became my primary language. Uh, my great grandfather was a poet. My grandmother read poetry to us often when we were children. Also grew up in the church. So verse, right, was a very strong staple in my household. So all of these things were very normal and common behaviors in my family. So writing verse was was very natural. And it's also, I think, you know, growing up in a big family with not a lot of space or privacy. I think poetry also offered me an opportunity to have my own private language so I could mm -hmm. write. If I'd written a diary, it would have been read and I was not prepared for that. But at least in poetry, I could write in code and I could mm -hmm. say what I wanted to say and still keep my secrets, you know? I, I love that. So, so you could write in poetry and keep your secrets. So like symbolic language and, and that kind of thing is what you're talking about, I assume? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's amazing. It's it's easy to think that poetry is the the harder of the two, you know, poetry versus prose, but it sounds like you were so steeped in that that world that it was it was kind of like like breathing, you know, you hear about some people that are that are like that. So what is your process like now as you as you write poetry? Do you have uh do you still have a kind of a journal with ideas in there or how how does a thought become a poem for you there are many processes uh, I have many journals um, I write pretty much daily and I they're not always poems I write I write a lot of different things poetry is my primary language I often refer to poetry as my my main boo but it's not my only <laughs> so I also write some prose and so I work in a lot of different projects. I also write lyrics, et cetera, right? So they all sort of start with a blank page um, and we see what happens. And sometimes it's a poem and sometimes it's something else. Um, also notebooks, but also, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, notes on your phone or in the olden days, uh, there might be, you know, a uh, lipstick and a cocktail napkin might be how they start. And so there's a lot of different ways that poems might begin. And I just write my way through it, right? I don't necessarily have an agenda when I show up to the page other than to see what happens. And it's this process of discovery. And I keep going until something until something happens. And some days, maybe nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> but most days, you know, you stay with it. Um, and maybe the first two or three pages are absolute nonsense. And then finally, you see what we've gotten 
there to come to, right? So I think of it sort of like my my process is very um I use a lot of cooking metaphors, right? When I talk about my writing. And so I think about, you know, I can't really cook in a messy kitchen. I have to make sure like the dishes are with the if the sink is piled high with dishes, you know, I can't. I can't start cooking. So I have to wash those dishes and clear a space for me to like do all the things that I need to do. And sometimes that's the writing practice for me is just clearing space until I can really get down to the business of what I'm there to do. And so a lot of times that first page, two pages, five pages, however many it might be, is just clearing space. It's just washing dishes. And so I don't judge it. I don't think about it. I'm just like, we're just getting these thoughts out and getting rid of it and clearing some space for the other things to come through. And it sometimes can take a long time to do that. Sometimes there's a lot of dishes clogging up all the sink, right? So that's mm-hmm. part of it, you know, and then it's sometimes just kind of idea generation. Sometimes there's just like word associations saying what happens there too. And so that part, I kind of think about like the French cooking technique, mise en place, right? Everything in its place. Mm-hmm. And so you get all your ingredients ready before you make anything, right? You pull everything out and you make sure all the ingredients are prepped. And so sometimes my writing practice is that way too, right? It's just like, I'm just digging, th- I'm pulling things out of the cupboard and seeing what's there and pulling things out of the refrigerator and saying like, what are my ingredients? And once I know what my ingredients are, then it helps me to know like, oh, maybe this is, maybe this is a song. Maybe this goes in memoir. Maybe this is a poem. And so I don't know that though, until I pull out all those ingredients. And so that's another part of that practice. And just like the, the emptying out, if you will, and kind of look surveying, like what's, what does the landscape offer us today? (laughs) What can we make? I love that metaphor. It's so multifaceted and it helps me to see um that your process it, it isn't super straightforward but there is a kind of order to it so when you're talking about uh that first part the free writing the getting everything cleared out is that mostly a a personal journaling practice like things going on in your life at the time or is it more based on the topic that you intend to explore for that day or, or does it just depend on the day Oh, I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Hmm, it's both. I don't know that there's a distinguishing point. Um, I think it's whatever thought is in my head. We begin there. Whatever word is sounding, whatever's happening. Right. And uh, and and there's often movement between them. Right. There's a lot of things that I'm like, well, I need to write this thing, uh, but I'm not going to do anything with it. Like this is not artful. This is not a poem. This is not everything. A thing that's ever going to be shared with anyone other than me. So this is just going to live here in this notebook, right? And then sometimes that'll lead into a thing of like, oh, oh, this might be a poem, right? So it might just start with like journaling out morning pages and then Mm -hmm. saying like, oh, this is like the theme of what I'm interested in right now. Or this is what I, what I feel like I most want to say right now. And that might turn into a thing. Okay. Okay. I like that. So, so once you have some of those, those ingredients pulled out and, and your mind is clear and more focused on that creation of poetry how do you distill an idea because that that's something that poetry is kind of uniquely suited to do of course is to concisely (laughs) get an idea across so how how do you still pack power in a small set of words do you edit a lot of times to really get that down or or how do you do that There's, I think it really depends on what I'm going to, what kind of poem it is and Mm -hmm. what I'm doing with it and where I think it's going to live and how it's going to be expressed. I think that I I tend to be a pretty concise writer. And so even in journaling, it's, it's going to be probably pretty, pretty concise. So it's really like writing prose has been really interesting um, to be in a space where you have like word counts and trying to like write towards like, it's just so many more words than I typically would write or academic papers, right? With word count requirements have always annoyed me because I'm just like, I said what I said in a paragraph. I don't need 10 pages. Like you can check sources if you want to, but like I've already summed it up. You know? <laughs> and so those are, those are things that like, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty concise generally. And then there is definitely a lot of, lot of revision, right? Like there's a ton of craft that comes into creating poetry. And so once I have some content, the content is going to drive that form, right? So it's really examining, Mm -hmm. okay, what is this poem about? What do I, what am I trying to say? How do I want it to feel? How do I want it to sound? And what are all the tools that I have as a poet to help it do all of those things and to communicate the thing that I'm really, really trying to communicate. And so sometimes that might mean that it's a really, really dense, thick little poem Sometimes that might, you know, lend well to to a sonnet, right? Sometimes it needs to be really, really musical. Sometimes it needs to be um, really 
staccato and sometimes it needs to be really legato, right? Just kind of mm -hmm. depending on how that poem. And so that's also going to inform the shape that it takes on the page, right? And whether it's, we're using long lines, short lines, whether we're using punctuation or no, whether we're capitalizing, whether, you know, all of these different things are going to come into uh, the questions that I'm asking around what, what I want this poem to do, how I want it to feel, how I want it to sound, what I want that reader to understand. And am I using all of the tools, right? Including uh, the page, and, and every piece of punctuation, right? And I do tend to be kind of, I'm a very, very free writer when it comes to just pre the, the original, you know, just getting words on the page. I don't judge it. I try to keep the critic out of my mind. I don't edit while I'm writing. Uh, but when it comes to revision, I'm, I'm a vicious editor. <laughs> so um, at that, once I'm in the revision space, then really like every character on the page has to fight for its life. And then I'm really going to go through each line and ask it like, so what, are you carrying your weight? Are you serving the poem? Like once I've identified the goals for that piece, hmm. uh, is, are you, are you doing something right? Are you, are you lifting? Are you doing your work or do like, do you need to still stay in this poem? Like, does this line still work without that word? Yes. Then the word doesn't need to be there anymore. Right. So these are, it, it, it I do get pretty, uh, pretty. So again, concise. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you said that the form needs to match and, and support the content. That's one of the main things that I try to teach my students as far as the definition of good writing, whether it's poetry or not, um, is the form actually supporting everything that that's being said. But poetry, you can just see it so much more clearly because there is this concision and and economy of words. So yeah, that was that was some some great advice the staccato and legato I'll have to I'll have to remember that one <laughs> so, it works in prose too though thinking about you know does. what we do right those short sentences versus a long sentence and right mm -hmm. those do and the way that we partner and pair them match them right like what they do for the rhythm of a piece there's musicality and prose too right so all of those things really it's true for all writing yeah absolutely um so you taught poetry in particular though for a long time you've organized poetry events you've you've presented poetry to quite a range of um different people so what are some common misconceptions that you have come up against about poetry i'm sure you've i'm sure you've heard lots of things <laughs> i think the main thing is you know i really try to disrupt the idea that poetry is for the elite i think people mm. elevate poetry and think like it because and it's really, I think, because generally, uh, especially in this country, I can speak for people don't get a great education in poetry. They don't receive a proper invitation to poetry. Right. And so people are reading poems that they can't necessarily access because they are written, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, sometimes thousands, depending on what's going on. Right. But they're uh, but they're not necessarily seeing themselves represented in those poems. And so I, I, I say all the time, poetry is a very large house and there is room for everyone in it. And I think especially now it's a very exciting time to be a poet. There are so many different things happening across genre. There's so many things happening across disciplines and all the different media that's available to us now. There are so many things that you can create and poetry has always pushed the boundaries, right? But also poetry has always been the language of the people. Where there are people, there are poets and poetry is also older than paper, right? So people think of it yeah. as again, like this very, very, it's been like sort of caged in academia in these upper echelons of, of places and really like poetry is like the very common language is the way that I like to think about it. Hmm. And it should be accessible and it should be an invitation uh, to your own emotional experience, right? It should be, um, if I'm doing my work as a poet, right? I'm, I'm inviting you to an emotional experience and you should have one when you engage with my work. And that's always my goal. That's, it, it's, it is easy to forget that although some poems are meant to be kind of puzzles to be solved among academics it, it the range is so enormous that that's one end of uh, the poetry spectrum but it's it it is for everybody it is it is everywhere in our society whether we we see it or not you know in music and and other places so yeah that's that's a good reminder so how do you see poetry um especially spoken poetry, bringing people together? Like, why do you think it is such a powerful tool? I think you've kind of hit on that already and uh, to a certain degree, but 
what is it about poetry that can bring people together? I think there are a lot of different aspects. Again, I think, again, poetry being the language of the people. Also, because poems are often short, they're much easier to excerpt than prose, right? <laughs> so it's easier to, there, there are a lot more poetry readings than there are story readings. Or, you know, if you're working on it, this book length project and novel, right? It's It can be difficult to find a proper place to really read that and like, you know, get some ears on it, right? You know, there, there aren't as many, the format um, of poetry allows itself to be shared easily in mm -hmm. small bites, right? These little, and so, and that also allows more people to share, right? So that also, so I think that's one of the reasons it's easy for people to gather around because 10 people can come together and bring, and bring a poem, right? And you're done in an hour, right? Whereas, you know, for for, for those, if you're working on longer projects and you're working on book length pieces, it's it's a little bit trickier, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to set up and you've got to explain characters and give background and write all these other things to, to, to just read like a small scene sometimes. So those are some things that just um, make it easier to commune around, right? I think it's also necessarily emotional, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the goal of poetry is to evoke emotion right that's part of its definition right? it's emotionally evocative and so I think that for for that deep feeling like I think that in some ways it's part of the reason that we read it's part of the reason that we write right is like knowing that we're not the only person that feels the way that we feel and so being in community around this really emotionally evocative language can be really helpful to actually mm -hmm. look and see that there are other people that feel this way and so that also I think is very very useful Another thing that I, I love about poetry is that, and poetry readings in particular, right? Sometimes people think like, oh, spoken word or whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't identify as a spoken word artist, but whatever. Um, like some people do, and that's fine. And also I, I, people do ascribe that to me often and it's not offensive. It's just like not like poetry is an oral language and always has been. Poetry is older than paper. And so there's not like this new thing, like we don't need a new language for it. Uh, really, it's just poetry and people reading poems aloud or performing poems aloud, whatever that means. But poetry is and has always been an oral language. Granted, I love the page and I'm also a big fan of the page and I love it. My goal is always for poems to work well in both places. And when I can give a reading and show the poems on a screen behind me, that's like my absolute jam, right? So <laughs> these Zoom times have been delightful when I can share my screen and read a poem and I can show you what I'm doing on the page and off. Love it, right? Poetry, like, you know, that's something that I think about often, right? Again, the musicality of poetry, but also poetry on paper is like sheet music. It is meant to be read aloud. You're instructing your reader how to how to perform this, how to read it out loud. This is you're showing them how the poem goes. So again, form, content, all of those things are, are crucial, right? Elements in poetry. So all of those things matter. But what I love about being in community and sharing poetry is that it is... Uh, an immediate way to workshop also, right? So from a craft element, poets are very, very fortunate in this way. We're like, you know, it's like stand-up comedy, right? Like you get the laugh or you don't get the laugh, you know, the joke is working or it's not, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get that immediate feedback from an audience, right? And you can hear, if we can, you can feel when the room changes, you can hear that, mm, you can hear, you know, like the, <laughs> And also, you know, I come, you know, mm -hmm. from, from a black tradition, like we are call and response people. So uh, in most of the readings that I came up in, like we, we are very audible in our responses, right? And so, you know, if the line is working or if it's not working, if you're hoping for this thing to do a thing here, you'll, you'll feel how the room is responding to it. And then sometimes people will literally come up to you after a reading and tell you exactly what that poem did for them, what it meant for them, how it made them feel, what permissions it gave them, et cetera, what questions they have about it. And so you get this really, you're immediately accountable to an audience you have access to an audience and you know how your work is impacting them because you can see it you can hear it you can feel it and they will tell you so that's something that I think is really lovely about poetry that I sometimes wish like I could just bring like can I read you guys this 20 page excerpt of the memoir and like, you know, it's, it's not the same right? it's not the same but poetry um I think is is communal in its nature that takes an extra level of courage. I'm a writer, but I'm an on-page writer, um, not somebody who performs my own work typically. So that it it uh, it does take some bravery to not only perform it but to get that immediate feedback. But I imagine it's incredibly rewarding when it does do exactly what you want it to do. That has to be just addicting, I would think. 
or sometimes doesn't, right? I started going to poetry readings when I was a teenager and there was one, this little coffee shop in Denver called the Black Pearl. And the first time that I went, a, a friend of mine had invited me. I'm sitting in the back and I see they are like booing and hissing each other. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I came with my, you know, my 15 year old poem and I was ready to read. And then I, I saw what the room was doing. It was, and there were, it wasn't a youth reading, right? These are adults and like, you know, a lot of like the older beat poets from that time. Right. You know? And so oh it was, it was its own energy. Um, but I did not read that night at all. I sat there quietly and listened and went, Oh, this is not what I was expecting at all. And I continued to go back to that reading every week for almost a year before I finally got up and read. Wow. Wow. That. <laughs> That's surprising. I mean, for the what I've found among most writers and and people who love books is is support generally. Either it works for people or it doesn't. But booing and hissing, my gosh, that takes it to another level, doesn't it? Well, I'm I, spent you went 12, back. I spent twelve years in poetry slam. After that, so there's also again a very audience interactive by design. Well, where can people find you and more of your work um, online for those the who want to check it out? Is uh, My website, suzyqsmith.com is probably the easiest way. And of course, I'm on many of the social media things. I'm on Instagram at suzyqsmith. I'm on Facebook at suzyqsmith. And um, I'm probably on Blue Sky, sort of. Are we on Twitter? Not really, but kind of. Um and TikTok, I just, I just can't. So I'm not there. It's not, it's maybe, not for everybody. <laughs> maybe one day. I don't know. I opened it once and went, oh, and then I closed it and never opened it again. <laughs> so, it was a little overwhelming for me, but um, perhaps one day. Well, I will have all of those links down below for those of you who want to see more from uh, Susie Q. Smith. Once again, thank you so much for talking with me. I have such good ideas about poetry to bring back to my students and ideas for my own prose now. So I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk us through your process and your thoughts on this topic. I really do uh, appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me, Carly. This has been a pleasure. Well, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe for more writing, publishing, and indie author life with a lot more interviews like this if you enjoyed it. Um, until next week, bye.